So I was hoping that we could start just by you unpacking what that actually is for us. If you could go first, Liz, <laughs> and you could tell us about 100 Resilient Cities, the history of it, and then what you do there. Sure, happy, happy to. Um, and uh, my name is Elizabeth Yee. We, uh, 100 Resilient Cities was actually um, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation as part of its centennial challenge in 2013. Um, and, and really a desire to focus on urban resilience and just given the, the, the continued trend towards urbanization. I couldn't have thanked the previous panels better for setting me up for this today. So, um, so th uh, the resilience to us is actually a very broad definition. And I think I've heard that theme repeated. It's, it's not just climate change. Um, it's not just poverty and access. It's, it's everything. So it's really creating communities that are stronger and able to withstand the stresses of city life um, as we continue to urbanize, so air quality, traffic, et cetera, but then also to manage better um, after natural hazard events occurred. So really the ability to bounce back quicker. Um, in terms of our program, uh, we are 100 resilient cities. We um, ran our first challenge for, uh, for cities um, in 2013 and ended up picking 32 cities. We just ran another challenge um, and picked another 35. That's out of over 700 applications. Um, our cities are around the world, um, everywhere from China to Africa, Australia, the US, um, and Europe. Uh, so we have um, a lot of different uh, cities that we are working with and, and consequently a lot of different challenges that we are trying to address. Our program, um, the, 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 I guess the benefits to the cities who apply, there, there are four really key components of our program. Um, the first is we grant fund a new position in the city called the Chief Resilience Officer. And that person is responsible for the resilience building efforts in the city. Um, that person is generally uh, one level under the mayor, so a very senior person in the city who's really responsible for gathering all the stakeholders together to create um, a more resilient city. The second part of the um, program is a strategy process, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, I, I would say all of our cities have some strategy of, of some sort. In fact, when we, San Francisco was one of our cities, and we found out that they had 67 climate adaptation plans. So we are not trying to create another one of those, but really try to take what they have and create a holistic plan that is beyond climate that looks at every aspect of the city um, and, and come up with some key focus areas that we can work on. Um, and the third part of our program is the part of the organization that I run, which is the platform. And, and we have great partners like Swiss Re helping us, um, who have donated their time and services to helping our cities really flesh out those focus areas and come um, and work towards solutions to address them. And then the fourth part of our organization is the network. And I think that's what I've heard talked about a lot today. It's really uh, our, our, all of our chief resilience officers are new in their jobs. Some of them came from the city before. Some of them are completely new to city government and life. And um, the ability for them to better understand their job by sharing knowledge and information, um, by sharing ideas uh, that, have, you know, that have already been successful or not successful in their cities is really uh, the important piece of the network. And so those are the four tenets of our program. Um, you know, just f for your information, we, l we have another round of, uh, one last round of cities, um, at least at this point, uh, and a challenge that we will probably run later this fall. So to the extent that you have any cities who are interested in working with us in our program, um, you know, please, please encourage them to apply. If you could do the same. Sure. I, I, I think people I, might even need an introduction about Swiss Re. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I fear I cannot be as eloquent as uh, Liz, but um, and definitely not as interesting because I do work for an insurance company. But um, <laughs> thank you for uh, for the opportunity to uh, to do my best. Um, my name is Nikhil Da Victoria Lobo. I work for a company called Swiss Reinsurance. Um, as the name suggests, uh, it's a reinsurance company. So for 151 years, our bread and butter business has been insuring insurance companies. Um, over time, that business model has evolved because the idea always was, why would an insurance company need insurance? Um, if you think about it uh, at a very localized level, and I hope many of the people in this room have car or home or personal life insurance, but if something happens to you, your insurance company fulfills its response, its, its promise to you, and uh, it has the assets to take care of you. Um, what happens is it becomes more problematic when you start looking at very large events, uh, very um, systemic events that create material shocks in society that an individual insurance company cannot respond to. 
um, back in 1863, the uh, impetus for the creation of Swiss Re was a fire in Galarus in Switzerland, a very small town which uh, I don't expect anyone to visit in the next, uh, in next year or so. But um, this fire devastated the insurance companies there. And what they realized was that they needed some mechanism so that when these catastrophic events happened, they had someone to turn to. Fast forward 151 years, what is our business today? It's still the bread and butter of insuring insurance companies. Um, and we do that around the world. Um, we have offices, I think, in 70 countries. And um, you name an insurance company, we've probably been there since their founding. But when you talk about these peak type risks, you also start to recognize that that also exists not just for insurance companies, but also for corporations. So about 20 years ago, we became very involved in the business of insuring the big corporations around the world. And today, we have a very large uh, client base of these corporations, the General Motors, um, the General Electrics. And you know, we can go through basically, you know, it's the Fortune 2000 of the world. And what these companies are worried about is the same catastrophic type events. But in this case, not their insurance portfolio, car insurance policies, but off, let's say, their factories, their offices, even their clients not being able to purchase, let's say, the goods they produce. And what we've done is we basically designed products, traditional insurance products, but also non-traditional ones, to help them take that risk off, let's say, their balance sheet. The last group that you may start to wonder as well, OK, you've talked about insurance companies, you've talked about corporations. What about the public sector? About uh, 10 years ago, actually, now, as of this December, um, as many of you know, there was um, a very material event in Asia with the tsunami. And it was, I think, a very strong wake-up call to many people in the industry and for Swiss Re as well. Because here you had this um, event that materially changed people's perceptions of risk. And yet, for our industry, it was a non-event. The conclusion our board came to was that a lot of that economic risk was being concentrated on the balance sheet of the government, either through government programs to help low-income populations, either through things like lost tax receipts, because now people can't produce, they can't pay their taxes, or from emergency response. And what that resulted in was the creation of my group, which is solely focused on developing risk transfer insurance instruments to help governments better protect themselves financially and therefore focus their energies on resilience and response. Great. I think it's interesting. I, maybe, <laughs> at least I, find, I find insurance rather interesting myself. Uh, I think that we've already gone past this in today's discussion, but it seems to me a lot of the adaptation, at least the layman's understanding of adaptation, is you know, either move to Canada or uh, build a seawall, these sort of hard solutions, or, or run away. Uh, it's more complicated than that, and I was asked both of you guys to prepare maybe a, a case study, a very small one if you could, to just give us an example of something that people don't think about when they think about what is resilience or climate adaptation, if we want to use that term. It doesn't even need to be climate, but and why don't you go ahead, Liz, if you don't mind. Sure. I think one of our, uh, one of our favorite and uh, most seminal case studies is actually one in Medellin um, in Colombia. And, you know, that throughout the 80s and 90s, I think, many of us are familiar with the crime and the violence that occurred in that city. And it, you know, at some point, the city kind of, in the 80s, 90s, said, enough is enough. Like, what do we need to do to change the, the way that life is here? And I think what they, what they realized is that, there's, that the, the economic center of the city is, the val is in the valley, and that the population centers were on the hillsides. And really, within those hillside populations, there was a lot of warring and gang factions because people couldn't reach the economic opportunity. There was no jobs. It took hours to get down the hill. It wasn't safe, um, and it wasn't, easy. it wasn't an easy passage. So you know what? Why not create transportation that goes from the center of town up to the hillside? And what they did was they actually created a series of gondolas um, up the hillside and then around the hillsides to connect, connect the communities and connect the communities with the economic opportunity. And as a result, um, the, the Medellin, I guess in general, went from having one of the highest murder rates in the world um, to, and to today, where they have an 80% reduction off of their peak. Um, and that was because they created jobs, they, uh, access to jobs. 
They created community centers within those communities where they created gondolas so that people could gather. They connected hillsides where gangs were separated before and now we're only five minutes away. So it, you know, it, it automatically created some sort of community cohesion. Um, and, and that's the kind of resilient solutions that we're looking to build, um, which is around multiple aspects around a solution. Um, that's, that's what our program is focused on and, and really trying to take that and port that knowledge to somewhere else that might have a very similar problem. And maybe it's not a gondola, um, but it's, you know, it's another means to creating a reduction in, in, in gang violence, for example, something that we're also looking at in New Orleans. Uh, I think one of the challenges on the discussion of resilience is it seems a very esoteric com uh, you know, concept. Um, you know, I, having just moved from New York, I've had the privilege of having to buy my first car here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. And um, I was struck at how straightforward the process is, except until the moment you have to buy the insurance. But thankfully, you can buy it <laughs> online. But um, what I saw was that actually, in some ways, we already practice resilience. Um, I presume there are people in this room who have uh, teenagers who are drive or are about to drive. And if you think about the way we've built resilience around driving, right? We've uh, created laws basically to say, you know, no one under 16 should be driving because they're crazy enough anyway. You know, you don't want to put them behind a wheel. But once that happens, um, you then have certain protections. As parents, you say, well, look, you can use the car in this and this time. Um, you know, the insurance companies put some restrictions on your car insurance. And, and even then, there are other things you do to basically um, protect yourself if you have a teenage driver, including probably keeping some money in the bank because you expect them to get some fender benders. And I see people nodding in the audience. So that's, um, uh, you know, if you take that same model, what I think we want to do is take what people do as resilience day to day and now impart it to, in our case, public institutions. Um, I think a good example is um, I have the fortune of working uh, closely with the city of Rio. And what they've tried to do is use the technology of big data to really start to transform how people look at risk and resilience in the city. And a good example is um, they've invested very heavily in what they call the Alert Rio system, which sends people early warnings about rainstorms. And this means that people can make decisions uh, basically in real time of how they act knowing that a rainstorm's coming. And for those who've had the luck of going to Rio, it's one of the most stunning places on Earth, but it's also, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, built similarly on hillsides. So rain is a very critical and disruptive element in life there. When I talk about resilience, we want to take it one step further, though. We want to build a mechanism where that same alert is also tied to, in my case, an insurance product. So that if people cannot make the decision for whatever reason to protect themselves, they know there's a fallback in some kind of insurance payment, also in real time, to help them rebuild their lives after the minor or major devastating event. That's what we mean by kind of a holistic risk approach, which is what resilience really is. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I've been struck in some of my travels for book reporting how much the culture of a place matters. And, and what you talk about with, with Rio reminds me of being in Bangladesh, where people have a dealt with shifting you know, shifting land, these chars, these islands appear and disappear down in the, down in the deltas. And so the, there's a bit of resilience built into the culture. Uh, and the translation there were, were things like raising ducks rather than chickens, because ducks float. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or more recently, doing their, the schools were, were shelters, cyclone shelters. There are, and then mobile alert networks. So everyone has a mobile phone now, and when a cyclone is coming, they do that. And this is something that people can manage. They had even schools on boats. Um, some of it was a little bit sad, but it was, it struck me that they're in the same with the Netherlands, where people were used to living with change. And so I wondered about if you could each speak to how much culture helps or hinders whether a place is resilient and what that means for your work. And uh, let's have you go first this time, Nikhil, just to switch it up. Yes. Uh, tough, <laughs> tough question. No, I think, um, I think the example of Bangladesh is, um, is a very good example of how uh, people naturally um, build risk management resilience into their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I grew up my entire life in the, uh, the emerging markets. And you know, when I started in my business and talking to governments, and this is about, let's say, seven years ago, uh, when pre-crisis, when we used to speak to um, governments, particularly in industrialized countries, 
Um, there was often a response from the ministries of finance, and uh, I, was, I don't know if the rear admiral is still here, but it's really eye-opening to hear that kind of commentary, and we should be lucky we have that kind of leadership. But um, when you talk to ministry of finance, they would say, well, no, we have, you know, we're a AAA-rated country, we have lots of money, we don't really need to talk about resilience or insurance because we have this great budget and we can um, pay for everything if we need to. Um, obviously, the financial crisis changed people's perspectives on what is too much or too little, too little money. But um, I think more materially, it began the transformation that I knew growing up in the emerging markets that resources do become scarce. And what we need to do in talking about that culture is it's very tough to overnight change the culture and make people more resilient. Um, Bangladesh has evolved that way after generations and, and more than generations. But what we do need to do is start looking around, I think, at what others are going through. Uh, and, and this is someone talked about the pol politicization of the discussion. Um, and start reflecting on, could that one day become our reality? So if you're a uh, farmer in the Midwest, um, you know, what you should be looking at is no longer other farmers of the Midwest as the proxy on how you make your, you know, farm, your family more resilient, but perhaps farmers in other countries who are now going through dramatic changes because of demographic shifts, climate change, uh, changes in world trade patterns. Um, and, you know, to, to close the thought on that, um, what I've seen in my discussions with governments is that, you know, when we started in this field, the main buyers of these types of um, what we call macro insurance were countries like Haiti, countries like Malawi. And increasingly, we're now seeing industrialized countries, particularly kind of states and municipalities, paying interest to the story and saying, well, tell me what you did in Malawi. Tell me what you did in Haiti. Hmm. Because they're seeing the first stages of where um, the framework that we've all come to trust and assure is always there is starting to be truly tested. And that's, I think, how you start to shift culture. It's not overnight. Interesting. Let's, speaking of shifting culture, let's talk a little bit more about cities and urbanization and why it's a little bit obvious, perhaps, to this crowd, but why 100 resilient cities would focus on cities at all. I think it, it really stemmed, I mean, initially stemmed from Dr. Roden's heavy involvement in Katrina um, and, and sort of the recovery there. But I think it's really the, the fact that, you know, I, and many of you already know the statistics, 70% of the world will be in cities by 2050, and we continue to grow into cities. I think um, also just looking economically, to take a page out of Nikhil's book, I mean, 80% you know, of the world's economy is derived from cities, yet only 50% of the population currently lives in cities. So, you know, if we expect the demographic shift to head in the direction of cities, and we're also generating a lot of our economics out of cities, they're an important place for us to fo focus our time and resources. And then most often, um, you know, geographically, we've got a lot of cities built um, in probably <laughs> in probably not the best areas for them to build in, like um, the Rear Admiral discussed, that we're, you know, we are in a lot of coastal areas and really trying to manage and, and mitigate those challenges um, to protect ourselves both financially and also personally. Yeah, we, and culturally, we, too. I guess we had the equivalent of naval bases back, back then when we first founded these Delta cities. Yeah. Um, you said something really interesting when we had the conversation before about benchmarks. The idea of mm -hmm. benchmarking, mm -hmm. if, if you can be involved with governments now and giving a reinsurance project, how that could help an individual homeowner not immediately, but again, as the culture of shifts. Could you explain that? Sure. Um, again, I'm maybe starting with a very personal anecdote. Besides the car, I'm now in the market to buy a house. And um, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Washington, D.C. But, um, you know, it was interesting looking at now how do you go about buying a house and you get, you know, mortgage rates. And it really helps to have some transparency on mortgage rates. And, um, I remember now coming to this, the question you asked about benchmarks. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with the Chilean Minister of Finance. And um, he was talking about how they did this sovereign bond issuance, right? The government issued bonds for Chile to finance Chile's needs. And he said, we don't need the money. But the reason we do it is because our corporations want to issue corporate bonds, but they need a benchmark. They need to know if the Chilean government finances at 3%. We as corporations can finance at 4%. But without that benchmark, they have no reference point. And it dawned on me one of the struggles, I think, 
um, we have individually, but also then uh, you know, as a broader society, and looking at risk is what is an appropriate benchmark? How risky am I? And part of, I think, the value of insurance, if done correctly, is to establish those benchmarks and to create that transparency. And I emphasize the correctly because I don't think insurance is naturally transparent to most of us right now. Uh, you know, what is the risk of your house? Most people wouldn't know. What we're trying to do on the public sector side, and I'll give you uh, a very clear uh, an example, a historical one, is work first with governments so that there are public benchmarks on how risky a city is. So for example, New York issued a storm surge, what they call a catastrophe bond, two years ago. And for the first time, the average New Yorker has some benchmark on what is the risk of New York City to storm surge. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. Think about it. People have lived in New York for <laughs> several hundred years, and now they finally have this benchmark for a risk that, if you look over the history, has always been there. Um, I worked on um, a project to ensure the government of Haiti against earthquakes, hurricanes, and rainfall. That work allowed us to eventually provide that same type of insurance to low-income populations in Haiti in a form of what they call microinsurance. And the reason we could do that is because we had those benchmarks and they had reference points. Yeah, it's, I, I, anecdotally, I've had friends who, uh, my, my wealthy friend, who was going to buy some, some beach property and did not because he was worried about sea level rise, but he didn't know how to price it in. Mm -hmm. Another friend is thinking about moving down to Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. the discussion they're having is, we can afford this house, but can we afford the fire insurance mm -hmm. in 15 years? Do we want to raise our son here? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have a good way to figure that out. Yep. And so this is a, a possibility now to get there. So yeah. I find that intriguing. Um, so we, we talked also how we were going to avoid the facile question of do reinsurers hope to get rich off of climate chaos mm -hmm. and get to something a little bit more interesting, which is can this be a solution for the poor as well as the rich? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, if my layman's understanding of insurance is that in order to price something in properly, you actually need to price it in. Will climate get so bad mm -hmm. that the poor can't afford it? And does that mean that there will be islands of people who have insurance, and, and insurance is clearly a, something that works well in the developed world, mm -hmm. can it work in the developing world? No, it's, an, it's an excellent question. And, um, I think that, again, kind of you know, thinking about you know, the, the people I've had the fortune to meet you know, growing up, but also in, in my work, if you talk to, um, I think about some of the uh, female entrepreneurs I met in Haiti, um, for them, they are making with every dollar a life and death decision for their family. And uh, I'm the last person to say, well, no, don't, don't worry about food on the table, buy insurance. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a silly, silly comment. And, um, but when you talk to people in depth, what you realize is that beyond their immediate concerns, um, sometimes the most exposed people and the ones with the least resources, the ones who are thinking the most about how to manage their risk. What I think we've struggled with, and we being the reinsurance and insurance industry, but also I think governments and uh, corporations is how do you then turn that clear need, how, how do you address it by thoughtful products? So not just saying, well, I sell earthquake insurance in Los Angeles, so let me sell you the same insurance in Haiti at not at just the same price, but the same policy. They need something different. Um, that's going to take a lot of effort. But to maybe the easy question, no, clearly there is a commercial business opportunity which is good because we want it to be sustainable. We want people to pour resources into this field because there are people who really need it more than the rich friend who's buying the beachfront property. Excellent. And I, I was saving your hard question as well. <laughs> the, um, the 100 resilient cities, are the rich ones going to be more resilient than the others? Uh, what, what does it actually mean to be in these different geographies, to have different amounts of money? Is this going to be a true partnership? Is it going to be the same, same issue, really? It, it, I'm glad you asked me that question when we had our organizing phone call. So I really <laughs> spent a little time to think about it. Um, you know, and, and, and kind of where I came out was, you know, we as assuming the US is one of the wealthier countries, um, we've, done, we've built a lot of infrastructure, but we haven't really built it resiliently. Um, and that's something we're struggling with and paying for now as a result. Some of our less sort of less fortunate peers um, in more vulnerable communities have actually been living with these challenges. Like you mm -hmm. said, Nikhil, they understand the risks. And actually, you know, they, they actually do it. 
better than we do. So, um, and they have the opportunity to do new and more things now. So, you know, it is actually, it's a good question um, and something that, you know, I, at the end of the day, I actually have my money on the, on the less fortunate communities because they're starting from scratch. They're learning what, um, what they need to do. Um, they've been living with these risks without any financial capacity or really capa capacity in general, in general to do them. And, and you know, really, um, at the end of the day, things that contribute to resilience um, don't actually cost that much. Uh, you know, we saw it um, in New York City. We call it the tale of two blackouts, um, the blackout from the 70s and then the blackout mm -hmm. in 2003. And the change in the city um, from one where that was very divisive and very angry um, and, and very crime-ridden to 2003 where, you know, people actually were helping each other and working together, that's community cohesion. That's social, that's a social network that you create. That doesn't cost money. Um, and so that you kind of see in, in these less sort of financially ad advantaged communities um, is stronger social cohesion than potentially um, in a community where everyone goes into a building, gets into their car, drives away, and doesn't have that social fabric together. So. Um, my money's, my money's on the less fortunate communities, at least in terms of um, building resilience uh, as it relates to our program. Well, I'm reminded of, of two things. One is the mobile phone networks versus landlines. Yeah. You know, the, sort of the ability of other countries to leapfrog what we've done in this mm -hmm. country. And uh, the second, if we're sharing personal stories, is, is my dad, who's a graphic designer, and early on bought a fleet of Macintosh computers. They spent all their money to buy right when the Macintoshes came out. These sort of black and white horrible things. And within, of course, six months or a year, they were outdated. They'd spent all their money, and they never, never actually caught up with the computer age. <laughs> they, and they were too early to the infrastructure. <laughs> so I think you're right that there's a lot of hope there. Um, well, we're on the topic of computers. I only, hopefully, people in the crowd will have questions, and we've got a little bit of time for that. But I do want to ask uh, the, the utility of, of big data. Mm -hmm. uh, reinsurance is obviously, insurance in general has been ahead of the, the curve here. So. Maybe you could speak s quickly about that and then the model that you've shared with 100 Resilient Cities, mm -hmm. explain what that is. And then uh, any other examples you might have from just, this is the, the latest and greatest. Is it helping our resilience? Um, very simply put, I think uh, big data for uh, resilience and insurance is going to be absolutely transformational. And for me, it's not um, the angle of um, just more called accurate insurance pricing, you know, but really a whole suite of effectively on-demand insurance products. And even more important than that, the transparency it will bring people who buy insurance. And I say that not as a vendor of insurance, but frankly on a personal level. Um, that I think will change the way, I certainly know I and my family will look at our insurance and risk pricing decisions. Um, on the issue of um, the cat and net, which is a kind of um, a model we shared with 100RC, um, it's basically, um, a, a GIS-based model that looks at uh, globally cata uh, catastrophic risk exposures. And the purpose was, again, to this point of transparency. Um, people know they're exposed, but an, there's a very different thing to knowing that you have earthquake risk than to seeing it visually on a screen. And um, I think, as a side comment, I used CatNet to send my sister-in-law a picture saying, hey, did you realize I'm not visiting your, the beach house because you're exposed to, uh, exposed <laughs> to hurricanes in, in <laughs> Norfolk? So um, it really changes the way you look at risk. And, and that was one of the reasons we wanted 100RC to have access to this tool. I think from our perspective, big data has actually been a, a really great driver of resilience. Um, it's helped our cities make more informed decisions. Um, it also, one of the key themes we hear from our cities and our chief resilience officers when we do these workshops and strategies is we have no idea what our citizens are thinking. They don't have the data. You know, it's the capacity to actually be able to share that data um, mm -hmm. like you're talking about with your sister-in-law. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the way that we're using it, um, and it's, I don't know if the rear admiral is here again, but still, but um, well, Norfolk is one of our cities, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, we are actually working with one of our partners, Palantir, um, to aggregate five different data streams uh, around flooding, 
Um, so looking at building data, looking at 311 data, looking at code violations, looking at natural hazards in general, and really trying to aggregate all of that and bring it together so that the city has in one central place all of its information and things that used to take weeks and months to try to identify, they can do in seconds. Um, and they can actually make better decisions um, as it relates to one of their key focus areas, which is land use planning and flooding management, uh, as the Rear Admiral discussed. And so that's, that's one way we're trying to take all this data, because cities have mounds of data that they're not using, and actually make it something um, that tangible that they can actually do use for better decisions. Um, another way that we're using big data is really trying to, trying to use connectivity. So the Internet of Things, or everything, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, you know, one of, one of the ways that we've thought about it in our cities is actually on parking. And I know that that's been used elsewhere as well. But um, you know, to reduce, uh, if you put parking sensors in on parking spaces, and you know, with mobile phone technology being so prevalent, re really being able to say, I need to park my car. I look at my iPhone or and figure out where the parking spaces is are. I go exactly to that spot. I reduce the amount of congestion of traffic in my city. I also improve the air quality. So we're using um, big data in in multiple different ways uh, to build resilience. That's great. Well, any questions? Please answer. I'll take maybe three at once, and then uh, I'll avoid the worst one. <laughs> and then, um, so. please go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Greta Byram. I'm actually with New America. Um, and we had our own brush with resilience um, in New York. We uh, partnered with an organization in New York that built a community wireless network um, in Red Hook. And what happened there was that when um, the big networks all failed, which they tend to do um, due to sort of net cascading network failures, um, this little scrappy kind of DIY network kept running. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when mm -hmm. FEMA showed up, they actually had to run their command center over this little <laughs> scrappy mesh network in the Red wow. Hook neighborhood. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting was observing the way that sort of centralized disaster management from a federal level came together with this scrappy community effort and how sort of power was shared uh, or sometimes not shared but usually shared and sort of how those relationships developed and um, it's led me to think a lot about how sort of centralized efforts kind of mix and match with local efforts and how um, both can sort of be honored in that kind of uh, working relationship um, and I'm curious as to what you guys think about that. And I think it's really apropos of things like the Rio Command and Control Center example where you do have centralized control over alerts, but what about actual, you know, sort of ground grassroots efforts to address things like, you know, why are people living in really dangerous places or could there be better wastewater management? Uh, hi, my name's Julian Spector, and um, I was also recently in Bangladesh for a reporting trip, and I, I was struck by how a lot of the coastal populations that are the most vulnerable to climate change are, are, you know, incredibly disconnected from the national economy, maybe making $150 a year kind of thing. Um, so how do you extend the, the protection of the insurance network to these kind of places that maybe don't even have a road to the mainland? Uh, you, you mentioned micro insurance in Haiti. I was wondering if you could talk more about uh, those initiatives and possibilities. Uh, Nina Gardner, um, Strategy International uh, Consulting Business on Sustainability. I have a question just on, um, probably for Elizabeth, but both of you. Um, has anybody actually calculated what the loss of GDP to the country and to New York was uh, over S Hurricane Sandy to try and, you know, ma make make the point that we need to, you know, buffer the island uh, in somehow help, I don't know, how you make, uh, you, you get the metros to be safe, but I mean, the metro goes down and it gets salt all over it, then people can't get to work and I don't know what it cost Wall Street uh, but it, it must have cost a fortune I mean we're talking billions so that should well, be well able Goldman to make Sachs the, the economic handbags <laughs> around the buildings the, you may know well something the economic <laughs> argument that we do have to invest in um, in all this infrastructure 
All right, let's, let's do four and then uh, race through them. How much time do we have? Hi, Michael Nix. Oh. Following on the uh, aftermath of that, when you talk about resilience and everything, Alex and I grew up on the shores of Lake Michigan. And I always, when, it, when you bring up these questions of resilience, I, I love this topic, but I always think of um, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and the levees there and how they were probably under uh, constructed. And then I think about my, my friend in Amsterdam and the Netherlands and how they've kind of expanded the size of the Netherlands. And in, still that's under, that's under water, or it's under sea level. The, the height of that property is under sea level. And I, and I never hear about problems in the, Am in the Netherlands with flooding and this kind of thing. I also see a great commitment by the Dutch towards resilience and this type of thing. And I was just wondering if you could kind of those might be two extremes. Mackenzie, this might be the question you throw out, but um, it's, it's, the, it, it's Katrina <laughs> versus the Netherlands and why I always hear about problems in New Orleans and I never hear about problems in the Netherlands. Well, I will. I'll answer that one quickly. They had some very big problems in the 50s, which is what, what uh, helped trigger some of the, the stuff they've done now. And the second thing about that is, is that the Dutch have agreed to evacuate certain areas in ways that were being talked about before. It's called Room for the River, and it's basically letting floodplains happen. Um, but let's combine, let's, I think we need to go quickly. So let's talk about insurance networks in Bangladesh first, if you could. Uh, I think Grameen would be interesting to talk sure. about. Um, well, uh, first, um, we actually do have a program in Bangladesh, um, an index-based insurance uh, through Oxfam um, for, it's at a kind of a pilot level, for extreme rainfall and flooding. Um, so to your point, I absolutely think it, it's critical. Um, one, and, and we have many of these all over the world, but maybe one more interesting philosophical, uh, I think, thought on this is there was a report published by, I believe, um, the IMF uh, recently, which looked, at, which basically made the conclusion that, well, um, the, the most, oh, sorry, it was by S&P, and that's material. Um, S&P basically said if you look at um, countries exposed to natural disasters, um, they also happen to be some of the most poor and financially weak countries in the world. And therefore, we need to do more. You know, they're exposed to climate. We need to help them. Um, I actually think there's a bit of, I would challenge S&P if someone from S&P is in the room. I think there's a bit of a cause and effect here. Um, I believe that if we were to dedicate some proper research, we would actually find that Countries that are the poorest and most exposed are potentially the ones that have historically been the most exposed to natural disasters. Because the central premise of what uh, I do when I talk to clients is say, look, um, if you're a government and you're building all these assets and building a future for people, you're only one natural disaster away from losing all that. And if you look at the history of a Haiti or a Bangladesh or many other countries, every time there's been a government that's made progress, uh, Mother Nature sets back the clock. So I believe that actually the cause and effect is reversed. It's not, um, uh, vul it's not poverty that's bred vulnerability. It's a vulnerability that's bred as poverty. And so the answer is, um, I think insurance, the short answer is I think insurance can help because it builds that safety net and hopefully builds, allows countries to build out of the mess. Perhaps you could very quickly mention the first cat bond you sold. Sure. Uh, I think it relates to the metro. Do I have that right? Um, well, in New the York, the, the first one uh, was in 2006. The government of Mexico bought, um, again, one of these cat bonds for uh, earthquake risk at the time. And I was speaking to the vice minister of finance, and we were talking about the transparency issue. And he said, look, what I really like about this is that beyond, you know, I can use this money to rebuild and, you know, um, and help poor populations. Uh, every morning, uh, I can log into my Bloomberg terminal and see the way the market is pricing Mexico's catastrophe risk. That's the kind of dialogue we want to have um, as individuals and as governments. And perhaps you could take the two about New York. I don't know if you know the, the figure for Sandy, or perhaps you do. Uh, I think it was, a, didn't they say it was about $50 billion? I think 54 about billion. 54. I just didn't know the exact number. Yeah, it was some, somewhere in there. <laughs> and you did sell a bond, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to, the the, to MTA yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to deal with the subways. But I, I think the question about the interface would be a good one for you between, since it seems like your work, the inter interface between sort of top-down and bottom-up. This is somewhat what you do. 
It is. It is. It is one component of what we do, and actually has been, I think, probably in, in the in our short-lived program, has been one of the biggest struggles. Is how do we, how do we get that um, grassroots effort and get that get people kind of engaged in the process of resilience building, and and we've used actually um, a lot of different technologies to do that um, to try to help. And I think what we're realizing is using technology, like for example, one of our, one of our platform partners is a company called Ushahidi, which was based out of Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and it's really helping our cities and our chief resilience officers understand what is citizen engagement, how do you do it, um, and you know, think along those lines. And so we're working with them um, in Boulder uh, to try to understand and try to engage that community around um, actually plan some planning, planning issues and, and, and to get their thoughts. Um, I also was thinking about San Francisco, which is another one of our cities, who's really been active in trying to get the community involved. And so they've set up um, a specific office around the community. They um, have been working with, actually it's more DRR, but um, they've been working with an organization called Team Rubicon to really try to help create community awareness and preparedness around disaster planning regarding earthquakes. And so trying to get that grassroots efforts um, and, and make sure at the same time that the city understands who those people are, make sure that they have leaders in their community so that when disaster hits, because they're really focused on preparing for the big one, um, you know, they know who it is, they know how to get that information out, and they've created the networks in advance of, um, of any disaster. So that, that is one way that um, our cities are doing that. Cool. I also just, if I could though, I kind of wanted to go to the question, the comment on the Netherlands, which I know, I don't know if you were trying to shove it under the rug, but I just oh, wanted uh, to answer no, that one. I was, I was, I was, I was getting, getting the look that we might be going over time, oh, but that's all. Okay, so go, do just it. two seconds on that. Um, you're right, uh, Rotterdam is one of our cities, and it's been a very, um, yeah, so it's been really interesting to see because a lot of our cities have really tried to learn from Rotterdam and the way that they live with water versus kind of fighting water. And I think that's that's the kind of the disconnect between, between potentially the two places. Um, but what I've, I've realized actually as part of that is they've spent a lot of money and time building the infrastructure as you were saying from the 50s and really trying to prepare themselves around it. But one of the things that we actually realized going through the strategy process with them um, and one of their focus areas is like, you know, we're great. We have great infrastructure. We have no people. We don't have any volunteerism in terms of figuring out, like San Francisco is doing, how to respond to that disaster if, our, if it doesn't work. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, um, we're using one of our partners um, to help them do some um, disa disaster preparedness from a volunteer perspective because the community itself, um, you know, is, is, feels very safe and protected, but they don't know how to respond. Um, so that's one thing that New Orleans does well that, you know, Rotterdam is working on. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>